Shepherd's having a birthday this week. Norlene's having one too, I think, next week. <laughs> Hannah's six. And we'll observe the Lord's table after this morning's worship service, and then there won't be any afternoon Bible study. Uh, other than that, I can't think of any announcement. Pray for the church family for the loss of Wayne. Uh, remember each other in your prayers and seek the Lord's help for this time. Uh, we begin our worship service with hymn number 294, Savior, Like a Shepherd Lead Us. <laughs> Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy path, the pastors lead us. For our use, thy fools prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus. Thou hast bought us, thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us, thine we are. We are thine, do thou befriend us, be the guardian of Send me bend us, seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, O oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, O oh, hear. When we pray, thou hast promised to receive us, poor sinful though we be, thou hast mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and power to free, blessed Jesus. Blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Early let us in Thy face. Scripture reading and prayer will sing hymn number 442. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. Begin reading at verse 18 and read through verse 21. For as much as you know, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times to you, for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him from the dead, and gave him glory that your faith and hope 
might be in God. Let us pray. Our Father, we bless you and thank you that our Lord is so clearly set forth in his redemptive work in this grand and glorious book. We are thankful for what we know because you have revealed it to us through the preaching of the gospel, giving us faith to receive and understand and to know. We are thankful that our confidence is not in ourselves, for there's nothing there worthy of confidence. But our confidence is in Jesus Christ, who sits at thy right hand even now, ever living to make intercession for us, who sits there because he earned the right to be there, having been obedient even to the death of the cross. Wherefore, you've highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he's Lord for your glory. Things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and things in the sea. We declare him to be Lord over all. We praise you for mercy and grace through Jesus Christ that is new every day. New beginnings every day as we awake in the dawn of the day knowing full well that thou art keeping us and holding us. And we praise you for that. Help us, Lord, as a congregation to remember each other in prayer. In prayer. Call out each other's name to heaven. Help us to seek you in all things and praise you. Help us this day as we go through this day of worship and to hear the gospel, as we preach the gospel, as we join together in communion around the Lord's table, rehearsing and memorializing and remembering what made us what we are as children of God the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Help us, we pray, to worship you now. In Christ's name, amen. Number 442. <clears throat> Excellent greatness, praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, for our sins he suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows, love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise him, praise him, Tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, 
in that hymn. <laughs> Stan, would you and Steve receive your offering, please? Let us pray. Father, again, we approach in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is King of kings and Lord of lords, prophet and priest and king. How excellent is he in all his ways and deeds. He is the unspeakable gift that came down from heaven from the father of lights in whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning a good and perfect gift to your children and with him you freely give them all things as we return unto you what's yours let us do so with joy praising him in our hearts for in Christ's name Amen <laughs> Invite your attention back to 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 18 starts off with the word, for as much as you know, as you know, the Bible says a great deal about the children of God knowing things. In 1 John it says that they have an unction from on high and they know all things. They know all things. Another place it says they have the mind of Christ. The promise of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31 says that they will not save to one another know the Lord because they'll all know him from the least to the greatest. They will know the Lord. Brother Mike Butler and I were talking about that passage on the phone the other day. We come to the conclusion that what that means that everybody will know the Lord is because previous to that he said he's written the law or his word in their hearts. He's written his word in their hearts. That's how they know the Lord. You don't know the Lord by meeting him on the street or 
seeing him in the sky or in some image on a muffin or whatever people see him in. We don't know the Lord that way. We know him in this word. In fact, he has magnified this word, it says, above his name. Words. And one of the words is applied to the child of God is he knows. He knows something, not guessing not wishing, not trying to find out something. He knows something. Scripture says we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. We know that. That's a great comfort in this world <laughs> to know that. Paul said, I know whom I believed and am persuaded. And he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Paul said in Romans 7, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. I know that. You know what a precious thing it is to know that? To know what you are by nature? Not everybody knows that. Only those who the Holy Spirit is taught knows that. Before they knew that, they thought sin was a, just something that everybody does. To the carnal mind, sin is a misdemeanor. To the spiritual mind, sin is capital, capital crime, worthy of death. And you know that. What a thing. What a thing that you know that. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, they are foolishness to him, neither can he know them, nor discern them. But the spiritual man discerneth all things. He knows everything. What you are out here this morning in this small congregation in the middle of nowhere in Cherokee, North Carolina, it's a bunch of know-it-alls. It's what you are. Ephesians 1 said, He has abounded toward us in wisdom and understanding abounded well what does it mean for God to abound toward us you know things that nobody can know apart from a work of sovereign almighty grace be thankful and Peter says in this passage in response actually to what he said prior to this for as much as you know, you are not, you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold and or from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of the Lamb. In verses 13 through 17, Peter gives some admonitions to the children of God. He says, wherefore, gird up your loins of your mind. He says, get ready. I'm going to tell you some stuff. <laughs> gird up your loins of your mind. He didn't even know your mind had loins if it didn't say it in the word. Be sober. Be sober. And hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fastening yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. How do you do that? How do you? Didn't say act holy. You're to be holy as God is holy. How is he holy? The only way you can be holy is to be essentially holy. You can't progress in it because God don't progress in his holiness. You can't work it up because God don't work it up. It says be, present tense, state of being, be. Just as he said in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 12, that you would be 
for the glory of God. You would exist in this world for his glory. God has called you to be holy. How? You're holy because you got Jesus Christ is your holiness. He is your sanctification. For of God are you in Christ, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification or holiness and redemption. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. If you call on the Father without respect to persons, judge us every man according to his works. Pass the time of your sojourn in here with fear. That means to worship, love, honor, and reverence God. Judge man every man according to his work. If we look at ourselves and read those passages, we're going to have some trouble. We're going to have some worries. We're going to have some awful stretches of the imagination. <laughs> but know this. God has ordained your good works. You are his workmanship, his poem, his poema. You are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that you should walk in them. Before he gives these admonitions to these people, they're not just anybody that he's talking to. He's talking to those whom God has saved by his sovereign grace. He refers to them in verse 1 as, uh, as, as strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Many times I sat beside the bedside of Wayne or next to his chair and we'd talk and he'd say, you know, we're just strangers here. We're just pilgrims. We're just passing through. Ain't nothing to lay hold of. Old Ralph Barnard used to say, don't hold on to this world so tight that God has to break your fingers and make you let it go. We're strangers. It's not our home. It's not our home. Earth is not our mother. The church is our mother. The new Jerusalem, according to Galatians chapter 4. And God is our father. And this earth belongs to man. He made it for man, according to Isaiah. He made it for man. He didn't make man for the earth. He made the earth for man. And you can see that in Genesis 1 in the natural creation. He created everything there was that would support man before he made man. And he told man, dominate this thing. Rule this thing. But there were strangers here. We're in the world, but not of the world, the Lord said. He says, they're elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And this is one of the instances when the foreknowledge means ordained or predestinated. Elect. A Greek word, eklektos, chosen out of, elect. When did that happen? Before the foundation of the world is when he chose his people. People who as of yes only, as of yet only existed in his purpose. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God through separation of the spirit. Separated unto God. Sanctification. That's one of the meanings of sanctification. To separate something for God's use. Unto the obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's not your obedience. That's his obedience. And the sprinkling of his blood. He said that we're blessed of God. To have a lively or a living hope. Or expectation. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have an inheritance. What does that mean? We must be in the family. We must be a family member to get an inheritance. And that inheritance is incorruptible and undefiled, does not fade away. It's reserved in heaven for you. And you are kept by the power of God. My soul, Lord, I'm thankful for that. 
See, I can't keep myself and I can't keep you. Your trials are actually blessings that shall shine forth as gold and bring honor and glory at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your trials and your temptations are by appointment. Another thing that Wayne used to tell me every time I was with him. <laughs> trials and temptations and afflictions are by appointment. We've never seen Jesus Christ. But we love him. Never seen him. That's what it says. Who having not seen you love. In whom though you see him not now. You believe. And you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. You believe God. That's a source of rejoicing. Because God gave you the faith to do so. We've never seen Christ. We will one day and we'll know him. Know him. Because we'll see him as he is. And we'll be like him one day. We know that. We know that. And then the, Peter gives these admonitions, and then in verse 18 he says, and this is why and the reason you will do these things. For as much as you know that you are not redeemed, with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation. The admonitions of verses 13 through 17 are accomplished upon a singular motivation, namely knowledge of what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. Motive. People don't talk about motive much anymore. The thing spoken of in our text this morning establish these establish these things and assures that the believer will hold and guard these things as precious and accomplished in a singular motivation of Jesus Christ. To the world, motive means little. The older I get, the longer I live, it seems to me that motive is sacrificed on the sacred altar of evidence. In religion, motive is rarely considered. People do whatever it takes to reach the goal or produce the evidence that religion is established as proof of faith. Religion seeks out many inventions designed to hold out the carrot on a stick notion of blessings being a result of admirable behavior. However, if a person does what he does to gain anything in the economy of God, it is an overt denial of the declaration that he has received all things in Jesus Christ. Motive for the child of God can have nothing to do with thought of gain. Faith never says what's in it for me. What can be gained for him who has all things anyway? If you got everything, what can you gain? The believer is motivated, and that motivation is set forth in our text for as much as you know. The motivation is born of knowledge. The believer knows because he has been given faith to believe, and what he knows, he knows for sure. When he looks at himself, he'd be full of doubts. When he looks at his life, his religious activity even, he'll be full of doubts. But when he looks at Christ, he'll never doubt. And those heard the hard sayings of Christ in John chapter 6 and walked away. Our Lord looked at his disciples and said, Will you go away also? Peter said, To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we, and this is in the right order, we believe. that thou art the son of the living God. And what the believer knows proves to be the only possible motivation for one who never considers gain in his obedience toward God. And if one vill willingly, voluntarily, gladly serves without consideration of gain, the words of this passage 
can be the only reason to do so. For as much as you were, you know, you were not redeemed with silver and gold from Bishmi, your father. In these words, we find ample reason pressed down, shaken together, and running over. To know this is to know joy and find motivation in the innermost beings to do what we do and have a reason for it. The believer knows that he's been redeemed. He's been redeemed. He does not consider this a process or a contingency plan conditioned upon his obedience. He knows nothing of possibility or probability or redemption waiting on his will or his decision. The believer doesn't know those things. He knows he has been redeemed. He has been redeemed. He knows that nothing about him has to do with his redemption. The price paid for his redemption was not anything that was or could be corrupted or could perish. Not corruptible things, things that perish. Your redemption had to do with things eternal and forever and everlasting. No man could supply the means or the price of redemption of the eternal soul. No man could. In Psalm 49, Psalm 49, verse 6 through 8 says this, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it seeth us forever. It's precious. mention of silver and gold but in our text no man can supply the means we know and it says there in Psalm 49 it says you're not redeemed by corruptible things perishing things like silver and like gold now the mention of silver and gold declares both a positive and a negative truth first it is an allusion to an atonement coinage, coinage of the old covenant and that's what actually brought me to first Peter <laughs> was the message I had ready for Wednesday night on the atonement money in Exodus chapter 30. And it brought me to First Peter in my thoughts. That's why I ended up here this morning. The children of Israel could not be numbered among the children of Israel unless atonement money was paid. Now this applied basically to the men who were above 20 years of age. But it dealt with all Israel. Negatively, this declares that the atonement money was not sufficient to actually redeem and was therefore only a picture of true redemption that was to come. Redemption is not by keeping the law. On the positive side, in order for one to be counted among God's children, the price of redemption must be paid. <laughs> must be paid. But once it's paid, redemption is complete. And that one is numbered with the blessed. The words traditions of your fathers could be a little misleading. We usually think of tradition in concert with practices or religious rites or ceremonies, but this phrase is actually one word. It refers to one thing, what you have received from your father. And what did you receive from your father? Your natural father. A carnal nature. A carnal nature. We all received that from our daddy Adam, which is manifest in vain conduct. It's simply another way of saying that nothing about us has part of our redemption. But the believer knows, however, that he has been redeemed. He knows that he's been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. The Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. This lamb was perfect, he was without sin, holy and harmless, and his blood was precious, of great value, honorable and dear. He was the perfect sacrifice, the only suitable sacrifice could actually answer for the sin debt. This blood was the price that God set for the redemption of his soul, blood and death are synonymous, and the highest esteem for this blood comes from God because it's God's own blood. That's what he said in Acts 20, 28, when he says, 
said to the disciples, take care of the church of God, which he purchased, bought, paid for, and possessed with his own blood. With his own blood. Blood represents the Lord's death by which the payment required for sin was met. He became a curse for us, it says in Galatians 3.13. For we were cursed under the law and he was became a curse for us. Because it says, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. That comes from Deuteronomy. When a person was found guilty of a certain sin, blasphemy or such, he was stoned to death. And then he was hung after he was dead. <laughs> you say, wow, that's a double whammy. Well, there was a reason for that. They stoned him and he laid there on the ground. They hung him up so everybody knew the law has been satisfied. See it hanging right there. Our Lord hung on a tree. And we can know from that that the law was satisfied. The law was satisfied. The believer, moreover, knows that the redemption was not the result of something that occurred in time. That is to say that the believer did something or failed to do something that caused a favorable reaction from God. This redemption was accomplished because the Redeemer was predestinated to accomplish it. Read Acts 4, verse 28. Of a truth against thy holy child, Jesus, Herod, and Pontius Pilate, and the Jews and the Gentiles, were gathered together, were gathered together. They didn't gather, they were gathered, herded like goats. Were gathered together for to do whatsoever God's will had ordained to be done. It says that, for as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from the vain conversation received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of the Lamb without spot or blemish, who was verily foreordained before the foundation of the world, before a man was ever walked, made from the dust, and in him breathed the breath of life. Before he walked upon the garden that God had made for him, there was already a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Already we were verily foreordained this redemption was accomplished because the Redeemer was predestinated to accomplish it. Before the world began, this redemption was set in order, purposed, and therefore merely waited to be performed in time. That's all it waited on, and it was, on Calvary's tree. The word but says, but with precious blood of the Lamb. The word but signifies that with this purpose redemption also comes the purpose, re purpose revelation. In verse 21, it says, Verily ordained, foreordained for the foundation of the world, but was manifest. In these last times to you, we were told about it. And this is the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We preach what God has done. We're not trying to get you to do something. We're not telling you there's something you can do. We're telling you a, a, a report, a a, 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 a something, some news, something that's happened, something that's taken place, and we're reporting it to you. Christ has redeemed his people from the curse of the law being made a curse for them. That's a past tense having done it. He has perfected forever them that are sanctified. That's past tense. It's news, my friend. Something wondrous has happened. Here I am to tell you about it. In these last days, he was manifest to you manifest to you who by him do believe what was manifest to the believer Christ and him crucified was revealed through the preaching of the gospel with the Holy Ghost come down from heaven that's what he says back in the first part of this chapter it was manifest was it made known <laughs> made known we know he was made known therefore we know we know. The believer knows that it is by Christ that he believes. By Christ. It's a wondrous thing, this thing called salvation. There are those who say, well, you can know Christ without doctrine. That's not true. You can't know Christ without doctrine, but you can't know doctrine without Christ. 
all sewed up, it seems, in this one person. Evidently, evidently God loved his son and put his, has put everything in his hands, according to John the Baptist. The believer knows that his faith is a result of Christ's redemptive work, and that faith came to him by Christ being manifest for him. Paul spoke of Christ when it pleased God to reveal Christ in me. I didn't know about it until I had it, until somebody told me I had it, after I heard the word of truth, which was good news, the good news of my salvation. God teaching men through the preached gospel, he said, all they are taught of God come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, this removes man from anything having anything to do with the spiritual estate in which he now resides. The believer believes in God, God who raised Christ from the dead and gave him glory by Christ who was raised from the dead. This matter of redemption, salvation, revelation, manifestation, and faith is sealed, is a sealed transaction. Enclosed top and bottom, left and right, beginning and end. In God. And you can't get it. I don't know what I am, and yet I do. That which I would, I do not. That which I would not, that's what I do. I live a strange existence. When I talk about my life, I've lived 77 years. I was talking to Jim Bird yesterday, he was, he was talking about three years from now. I said, yeah, I'll be 80 in about two and a half years. Some of you are already 80. Been a long time, life. Is this my life? No. <laughs> no. My life is here with God in Christ. What does that mean? I better not try be trying to figure out what's spiritual and what ain't. <laughs> what's good works and what's not. Because you see, my life is I don't really know anything about my life yet except that it's in Christ and that's only by faith do I know that I can't prove it I can't produce evidence of it my life is hid with God in Christ and cry when Christ who is our life shall appear then we'll appear with him also because he's our life I don't know what that means, <laughs> but it sure sounds exciting, and I sure do like to think about it. The believer knows this, and knowing this motivates him to act out of thanksgiving and praise toward God. I know this about the people of God. They're thankful people because they've had everything done for them. The believer has faith and hope. And since he knows that he had nothing to do with his redemption, that faith and hope rests in God alone. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, I, I'm feeble and I can't preach very well. I don't use great swelling words of men's wisdom so that your faith would rest in God and not in me. That's where faith must rest. A believer cannot look to himself because there's nothing there but vain conversation received by the tradition of the fathers. The believer has faith born of knowledge that he's been fully redeemed by Jesus Christ. That old song, I'm redeemed by love divine, glory, glory, Christ is mine. This is the ample motive to obey the admonitions of God. It's the only motivation to do so. Why would you obey God for as much as I know I'm not redeemed with precious things or corrupting things like silver and gold or tradition of my fathers? I'm redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He's very, fairly poor man now. He gave me faith to believe he's the author and the finisher of it. And as we partake the Lord's table this morning, we're doing so. Commemoration 
we're saying, we're taking of this bread and this wine, we're saying, I know I've been worthy by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We will sing that out of church song here. Those who I preached about this morning, those who know, those who are elect, according to the foreknowledge of God, sanctified through the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, who are kept by the power of God, who see Jesus though they see him not, who wait for that glorious salvation, who are holy in God, whose works are ordained of God, who know that they're redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. If you're a believer this morning, welcome to this table. For a moment, let us ponder and think about the fact that Jesus Christ hath redeemed us by the blood of the precious blood of the Lamb. But Father, help us to appreciate what you're about to do and give us hearts of thanksgiving, knowing full well that everything we have, we have because of your mercy and grace. We bless you, Father, for the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Let us take these elements with thanksgiving, we pray in Christ's name. as you know you're redeemed not with corruptible things like silver and gold or tradition of your fathers but you know you're redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb our Lord took the bread that night of the Passover and sent it to his disciples to break it and handed it to him and said this is my body broken for you as often as you eat this bread do it in remembrance of me Late night he took the cup and after he blessed it he said this cup is a new covenant new testament in my blood what covenant is that it's the one where it says you'll not have to tell each other know the Lord every God from you and every one of God's children from now do you know for as much as you know 
when you drink this cup, you're going to show forth my death until I come again. Do this in my name. They stood together and said to him, Now, Lord, when thou be betrayed, let's stand together. <coughs> my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Well, you ain't got the COVID, you ain't sick. Worried about being sick. Just give each other a hug and tell each other you love each other. I'll tell you all right now, I love the heck out of you. God bless you. <laughs>